So interpersonal trust and social trust are both essential to society. And this is basically how it works. We have mechanisms that induce people to behave in a trustworthy manner, both interpersonally and socially. This in turn allows others to be trusting, which enables trust in the society, and that's what keeps society function. Now, this system isn't perfect. There are always gonna be untrustworthy people, but most of us being trustworthy most of the time is good enough. So I wrote about this about a decade ago in a book called Liars and Outliers. And I wrote about four systems for enabling trust, our innate morals, concern about our reputation, the laws we live under, and security, security technologies. And I wrote about how the first two are more informal than the last two, how the last two scale better, right? They allow for more complex and larger societies, and they're the ones that enable cooperation among strangers. What I didn't appreciate is how different the first and last two were. So morals and reputation are person to person. They're based on human connection, mutual understanding, vulnerability, respect, integrity, generosity, all these human things. And that's what underpins interpersonal trust. Laws and secure technologies are systems of trust that force us to act trustworthy, and they're the basis of a social trust. So taxi driver used to be one of the country's most dangerous professions. And Uber changed that, right? I don't know my Uber driver, but the rules and the technology let us both be confident that neither one of us will cheat or attack each other, right? We're both under constant surveillance and we're competing for star rankings. The critical point here is that social trust scales better. You used to need a personal relationship with a banker to get a loan. Now it's done all algorithmically. And you have a lot more options to choose from. But that, and that scale is vital, right? In today's society, we regularly trust or not governments, corporations, brands, organizations, groups. Like it's not so much I trusted the particular pilot the last time I flew somewhere, but instead I trusted Delta Airlines to put well-trained and well-rested pilots in cockpits on schedule, right? I don't trust the cooks and the wait staff at the restaurant, really the system of the health codes they work under. Like, and I couldn't even describe the banking system that I trusted when I used an ATM machine this morning, right? Again, this confidence is no more than reliability and predictability. Right? So think of that restaurant again. Imagine it's a fast food restaurant. It employs teenagers, right? The food is almost certainly safe. It's probably safer than in high-end restaurants because the corporate systems of reliability and predictability guide those people's every behavior. And that's the difference, right? You're gonna ask a friend to deliver a package across town or you can pay the post office to do the same thing. The former is based on interpersonal trust, right? Based on morals and reputation. I know my friend and how reliable they are. The second is a service made possible by social trust. And to the extent that it is reliable and predictable, it's primarily based on laws and technologies. Both of those will get my package delivered, but only the second can become the global package delivery systems that is FedEx. And because of how large and complex society has become, we have replaced many of the rituals and behaviors of interpersonal trust with the security mechanisms that enforce reliability and predictability, social trust. But because we use the same word for both, we regularly confuse them. And when we do that, we're making a category error. And we do it all the time with governments, with organizations, and with corporations. We might think of them as friends when they're actually services. And both language and the laws make this an easy category error to make. Right? We imagine they're friends, but they're not. Corporations are not capable of having that kind of relationship. And we are about to make that same category with AI. We're going to think of them as friends when they're not. So a lot has been written about AI's existential risk, right? The worry is they will have a goal and will harm humans in the process of achieving it. You probably read, a, read about the paperclip maximizer. Kind of a weird fear. Science fiction artist of Ted Chang writes about it, like instead of solving all humanity's problems or wandering off proving mathematical theorems, the AI single-mindedly pursues the goal of maximizing production. And Chang points out this is every corporation's business plan and that our fears of AI are basically fears of capitalism. Science fiction writer Charlie Strauss takes it one step further. He calls corporations slow AI by profit maximizing the machines. And near-term AI will largely be controlled by corporations, which will use them towards that profit-maximizing goal. They won't be our friends. At best, they'll be useful services, 
more likely they'll spy on us and try to manipulate us. This is nothing new. Surveillance is the business model of the internet. Manipulation is the other business model of the internet. And we use all of these services as if there are agents working on our behalf, when in fact they are double agents also secretly working for the corporate owners. We trust them, but they're not trustworthy. They're not our friends, they're services. And it's gonna be no different with AI, but the results will be much worse for two reasons. So the first is that these AI systems will be more relational. We'll be conversing with them using natural language. And as such, we will naturally ascribe human-like characteristics to them. And this relational nature will make it easier for those double agents to do their work. Right? So did your chatbot recommend a particular airline or hotel because it's truly the best deal given your particular set of needs or because the AI company got a kickback from those providers? When you asked to explain a political issue, did it bias that explanation towards the company's position or towards the position of whoever political party gave it the most money? The conversational interface will help hide their agenda. The second reason to be concerned is that these AIs will be more intimate. One of the promises of generative AI is a personal digital assistant. It's what we're talking about here, right? Acting as an advocate for you, as a butler for you, as your agent to others. And this will require an intimacy greater than your search engine, than your email provider, your cloud storage system, your phone. You're gonna want it with you 24 seven, constantly training on everything you do you will want to know everything about you so it most effectively work on your behalf. And, you know, taken to its extreme, it'll help you in many ways. It can notice your moods and know what to suggest, can anticipate your needs and work to satisfy them. It'll be your therapist, your life coach, your relationship counselor. You will default to thinking of it as a friend. You will speak to it in natural language. It will respond in kind. If it's a robot, it'll look humanoid or at least like an animal. You, it will interact with the whole of your existence just like another person would. And the natural language interface is critical here. We are primed to think of others who speak our language as people. And we have sometimes have a trouble thinking of others who speak a different language that way, right? We make that category error with obvious non-people like cartoon characters. We will naturally have a theory of mind about any AI we talk with. Or more specifically, we tend to assume that something's implementation is the same as its interface. And that is, we assume that things are the same on the inside as they are on the surface. Like, so humans are like that, we're people through and through. A government is systematic and bureaucratic on the inside. You're not gonna mistake it for the person when you interact with it. But this is a category area we make in corporations. We sometimes mistake the organization for its spokesperson. Now, AI has a fully relational interface. It talks like a person, but it has an equally fully systemic implementation, right? Like a corporation, much, much, much more so. There are no people in there. The implementation and interface are much more divergent of anything we've ever encountered to date by a lot. And you will want to trust it. It'll use your mannerisms and your cultural references. It'll have a convincing voice, a confident tone, or authoritarian manner. Its personality will be optimized to exactly what you like and what you respond to. It will act trustworthy, but it will not be trustworthy. We won't know how they're trained. We will know their secret instructions. We will know their biases, either accidental or deliberate. We do know that they are built at enormous expense mostly in secret, by profit-maximizing corporations for their own benefit. And I think it's no accident these corporate AIs have a human-like interface. There's nothing inevitable about that. It's a design choice. It can be designed to be less personal, less human-like, more obviously a service, like a search engine. Right? When ChatGPT types out its answer, that's bullshit, making you think something is in there typing. And the companies want you to make the friend service category error and they will exploit you mistaking it for a friend. And you might not have any choice but to use it because there's something else we want to talk about here when it comes to trust and that's power. Sometimes we have no choice but to trust someone or something because they are powerful, right? We're forced to trust the local police. 
we're forced to trust some corporations because there are no viable alternatives. Or to be more precise, we have no choice but to entrust ourselves to them. We will be in the same position with AI. We will have no choice but to entrust ourselves to the decision making. And the friend service confusion will help mask this powerful power differential. Right? We'll forget how powerful the corporation behind the AI is because we'll be fixated on the person we think the AI is. Okay, this is a long-winded way of saying that we need trustworthy AI. AI whose behavior is understood, whose training is understood, whose biases are understood, whose goals are understood. And the market will not provide this on their, on its own. And corporations are prof, profit maximizers. And I think the incentives to surveillance capitalism are just too much to resist. It is in the end government who provides the underlying mechanisms for social trust essential to society. Think about contract law or property law or personal safety law or any of the health and safety codes that let you board a plane, eat at a restaurant, or buy a pharmaceutical. The more that you can trust that your societal interactions are reliable and predictable, the more you can ignore the details. And government can do this with AI. I mean, I want tra AI transparency laws, when it's used, how it's used, what biases it has. I want laws regulating AI and robotic safety when it's permitted to affect the world. I want laws that enforce the trustworthiness of AI, which means the ability to recognize when those laws are being broken and penalties sufficiently large to extend trustworthy behavior. I think a lot of countries are contemplating AI safety and security laws. EU is almost there, but I think largely they're making a mistake. They try to regulate the AI and not the humans behind them. AIs are not people, they don't have agency, they're built by and trained by people, mostly corporations, right? And I want AI regulations to create restrictions on those people and those corporations. And we need one final thing, public AI models. I want fundamental models built by academia or nonprofit groups or government itself that can be owned and run by individuals. And in the last question session, this came up. Term public model is thrown around a lot. Uh, I wanna detail what I mean. It's not a corporate model that the public is free to use. It's not a corporate model the government is licensed. It's not even an open source model. It's a public model built by the public for the public with political accountability, not just market accountability, openness and transparency, transparency paired with a response to the public demands available to anyone to build on top of, means universal access, and like a foundation for a free market in AI innovations. And then this would be a counterbalance to corporate owned AI. So I don't think we can ever make AI into our friends, but we can make it into trustworthy services, right? Agents and not double agents, but only if government mandates it. We can put limits on surveillance capitalism, but only if government mandates it. And I think it's well within government's power to do this. And more importantly, it is essential for government to do this. Because the point of government is to create social trust. To the extent the government does this, it succeeds. And to the extent the government doesn't do this, it fails. And I know this is gonna be hard. Today's governments have a lot of trouble effectively regulating slow AI, corporations. Like why should we expect them to be able to regulate fast AI? But they have to. We need government to constrain the behavior of corporations and the AIs they build, deploy, and control. Government needs to enforce both predictability and reliability. And that is how we can create the social trust that society needs to thrive in this AI age. So thank you. Thank you, Bruce. That's awesome. I uh, didn't get the mute off in time so you could hear all the applause in the room. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, so thank there. you. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Now the mute's off. Uh, really appreciate you coming in uh, and, and sharing that with us, Bruce. Uh, thank you so much.